Good morning. And welcome to uh, Maranatha Church this morning. And as we come to worship and praise God, we also welcome those who are here via Zoom as well this morning and pray that uh, you will also be blessed by the, by the service and that. As our opening prayer, let us hear these words. Oh God, you pour out the, the spirit of grace and love. Deliver us from cold hearts and wandering thoughts that will steady minds and burning zeal. We may worship you, O Lord, in spirit and truth. We pray that your spirit may be upon us this morning as we come together to praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us respond with uh, the opening sentences uh, from Psalm 105, Romans 5, and Revelations 4. The love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let us receive the Lord's greeting. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the whole fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all people said, Amen. This time we have the opportunity to use our voices in, in song and singing God himself is with us. seated. 
I should introduce myself. I didn't do that in the welcome of that. For those who don't know who I am, my name is Rob Datum. I'm the executive director of the Lighthouse downtown uh, Toronto and as the community center. Uh, we work with refugees, immigrants, as well as low-income individuals. And uh, some days it's very busy, uh, busier than we'd like, but yet, uh, especially on food bank days. Uh, a couple of days ago, or last week, we had a couple of days Food bank, we almost served 100 households each day, and that's a lot. Um, we've been averaging around seven, 60 to 70, but uh, this past week was almost 100 each of those days, and we're going, well, where are they coming from? But they keep coming. And, uh, and it's, it's sad to see it happening, but we know because of the economic situations that many are struggling with that it is happening. And uh, so uh, it's, a, it's, it's a great ministry to be working in, but, and it's, but it's also a challenge at times as well because we're always uh, saying, how can we meet the needs? One of the things the Lighthouse has just recently did, uh, which you'll see if, once we get the uh, next newsletter out, we hired a new person to help out with uh, filling out referrals forms. She started in the middle of May, and she's already been busy... Uh, helping people fill out uh, forms for housing, forms for uh, immigration purposes, and, and that, it's, it's a, a, amazing. Once people hear that we have someone like that, they come, seem to come out of the woodwork as well. But uh, we're, we're thankful for that, that uh, she is uh, able to uh, uh, do that work for us and that. And so I ask that for your pr continued prayers for the Lighthouse as we continue to reach out and touch the lives of people uh, with what we do, and hopefully through that, the gospel of Christ is also shared with them. Let us at this time have, go to our time of confession and assurance of pardon, where our confession we join together, saying, Our Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, we have come to know that you are the God of redeeming grace we never deserve, yet receive. In celebration of the power of Pentecost, we are able always to confess our sins to you, knowing that being made right with you is made sure in Christ alone. Hear us now as we come to you in a time of silent prayer. Our Lord has poured out his spirit on all people. Us today, we are given today all the grace of forgiveness and all the grace of being his people forever. God, we are thankful that through your spirit, you are always with us. In Jesus' name, we bear us in the church. In Jesus' name, we rejoice to live forever as your daughters and sons. We rejoice for the spirit of hope in us. We now seek your power given to him as he thankful and believe lives. This time we have the opportunity to sing Spirit of the Living God.
rules for holy living, they decided to look at Matthew 22 as the rule of holy living since we'll also be looking at uh, the preparatory exhortation for the Lord's Supper later on. So I th thought we'd keep or d use the summary of the law in Matthew 22 as our rules for holy living. Our Lord Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. When we hear about the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, for the people of Israel, they were commandments that they were required to follow. They are still commandments for us today, but they're done, they're, they're summarized in this way. One is that we are need to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, as well as love our neighbor as ourself. If we divide the Ten Commandments up into sections, we'll see the first part focuses on how we need to love the Lord our God, and the second part focuses on how we need to also love our neighbor as ourself. And as it says in Matthew 22, on these two commandments that were written here in Matthew, hang all the law and the prophets. So what's in the Old Testament is guidelines for us still today so that we can show our love to the Lord as well as those who are our neighbors. This time we have the opportunity for congregational prayer. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the sunshine that's shining, for the warmth that is there from the sun. We just thank you, Lord, that you continue to watch over us and we see the beauty of your creation around us. Lord, we see how spring has arrived and everything is starting to grow and it just reminds us once again how the seasons change. And how a new life begins. And how you are in control of everything. Because sometimes we look at some of this, the species out there of trees, of plants. And we say, Didn't they, weren't they dead? And yet, they spring new life. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that we can look at creation and see your glory and see you in it. But Lord, it also reminds us of what you're doing in each one of us today. Today on this Pentecost Sunday, we recognize what the, you have done for the disciples on Pentecost Sunday, where the, the Spirit came on them, but also today, the Spirit is in us, part of us, and on us. And so we thank you, Lord, that we are continually reminded of that on a special Sunday, as we call Pentecost Sunday, acknowledging what it means for the Spirit to be upon us. Lord, we pray that your spirit may be a guiding light for us in each and every day, each and every hour as we focus on things around us. We pray that your spirit may guide us through it, that we will make the right decisions that will benefit and glorify you, as well as help us to continue to grow. Grow in your understanding. Grow in your knowledge. Grow in your truth and wisdom. Lord, we give thanks. 
Lord, we give praise. We glorify you. Lord, we also pray for this congregation as they've been without a shepherd for many years. We pray, Lord, that you would guide them continually with pastors who come and preach on this pulpit, that they, the, your word may be enriching for them. But we also pray that you would guide someone to be the shepherd here at Maranatha Woodbridge. Lord, we pray that you would show this congregation who you want to have here, who you want to be the guiding shepherd to this congregation. Lord, we pray for the elders and deacons as they continue to make decisions and continue to lead this congregation. And we just pray that you would be with them, near to them, watch over them. Give them the wisdom that is needed. We pray too, Lord, for the musicians who are in this church, who continually guide the, the, the services on Sunday through music. We give thanks for them and pray that you would continue to be with them, enrich them with your blessing. Lord, we pray for each and every member of this congregation and pray that you would bless them and enrich them, that they may show the light of the gospel to those around them. Lord, we thank you for that. We give thanks, Lord, for Marika and Darren Veenstra, or Derek Veenstra, Lord, as they were married yesterday. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them in their new adventure new endeavor and lord we just pray that your spirit would surround them be near to them guide them in their marriage and that their marriage may be also have you as their main focal point as well as we pray that you would bless as they are united now together we pray that your spirit may be with them guide them and give them the wisdom that they need to continue to follow you. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with illness, for suffering with pain. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to be with them. And we know that you are the great healer, and we pray that you would place your healing hand upon them. We pray that your spirit may be a guiding light for us, that you, as we continue to worship you and to give praise to you this morning, we pray that your spirit may be upon us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to sing number 746, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God. That's in the uh, uh, Lift Up Your Hearts uh, songbook. <laughs>
Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and before we read God's word, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word, we pray that your spirit may be upon us, guide us, help us to understand your word. We pray, Lord, that your word may come alive for us this morning. As we hear your word, we pray that you would be with your messenger as he brings forth the message you've placed upon his heart. For all of us to hear this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to read the first 13 verses of, of Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violet wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in, in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Pergia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. So far the reading of God's word, and may it be a guiding light unto our path. Whoops. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to start off with a story. The son of a wealthy man expected to receive a sports car for his graduation. Instead, his dad called him into his study and told him that he loved him and handed him a wrapped up present. When he opened it, he found it to be a box containing a leather bound Bible with his name inscribed on the spine. Angrily, the young man tossed the box on his father's desk and stormed out saying, with, with all your money, all you can give me is a Bible? And they never spoke again, despite the fact that the young man's father tried hard to contact him. Years later, he got a call to say his dad had died leaving him everything. As he was going through his father's belongings, he found that the Bible was still in its box. Curious, he took the Bible out of the box and opened it. The page fell open to a passage his father had marked, and as he looked at that page, he noticed that his dad had underlined Matthew 7, verse 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your father give what is good to those who ask him? As he read it, a car key 
fell from inside the Bible. It had a tag with the dealer's name on it for the sports car that he had wanted years earlier. On the tag, beside his graduation date, were the words, Paid in full, love, dad. Pentecost is a season when we remember God's great gift to us following the death of his son in our place on the cross. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. The text says when the spirit of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. What does Pentecost mean? It is the Greek word for the 50th. Today is the 50th day since Easter. Now, if you're a math geek, you might object at me saying that and say that it's been exactly seven weeks since Easter. And so this is only the 49th day. day. But you're not doing Jewish math. They count both the first Sunday and the last Sunday in this stretch of time. For example, it's been eight Jewish days since we've had met together. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Eight days if you count both Sundays. That's how you get the extra day. Every year, Pentecost is 50 Jewish days after Easter Sunday, seven weeks. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. You were hanging out in one of your friends, and in one of your friends' homes at nine in the morning. You and your friends are waiting for on God, and you wonder what is next. Suddenly, swoosh, a massive gust of wind enters the house and surrounds you and shakes the house and scares you and excites you. And then you see fire on top of your friends. Heads, and they say there is a fire on your head. God is in your house. He enters your friends and he enters you. The Spirit of God is bubbling and bursting inside of you. And you begin to speak in a foreign language. And your friends speak in foreign languages. And you go outside and you meet an international religious crowd and you mingle with them. And they say that they hear you speak in their language. They are amazed and they are perplexed and they ask, what does this mean? Sometimes I wonder what does that mean? What would it be like as a pastor walking into a church and you had people from different nationalities who couldn't speak English and all of a sudden you were talking to them and they, they could hear exactly what you were saying in their language. Wow. That's what happened on Pentecost Sunday. What does it mean? What does Pentecost mean? We need to travel back to the Old Testament to help us to answer that question. I grew up thinking that Pentecost was only a Christian celebration. I figured that since the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost and the Holy Spirit comes to Christians, it must only be a Christian special day. Not true. We notice in the text that on the day of Pentecost, there are Jews gathered in Jerusalem from all over the world. They come from the West and Rome. They come from the East, modern day Iraq and Iran. They come from the north, modern-day Turkey. They come from the south, Egypt and North Africa. Why are these Jews in Israel? They are in Jerusalem, I should say. Why are they in Jerusalem? They are in Jerusalem because Pentecost is a Jewish holiday. 
Pentecost is a Jewish feast. They call it the Feast of Weeks. It takes place 50 days after Passover, which we call Easter weekend. We read of this in Leviticus 23, verse 15 to 22. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheath of the wave offerings, count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. At Pentecost, the Jews would bring a love offering to the Lord in Jerusalem to celebrate his provision. There is more Old Testament background. The Jews are bringing a love offering to the Lord to celebrate. They are also doing something else. During the time between the writing of the Old Testament and the writing of the New Testament, around 40, 400 years, there were developed a tradition. The Jewish people came to believe that Pentecost or their Feast of Weeks was the day that God gave, gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And this is very understandable. It's not unreasonable. Moses had passed over with the Israelites in Egypt and then took off with them across the Red Sea into the desert. It's not unreasonable that by the 50th day, they would come to Mount Sinai and God would give Moses the law. This cannot be proven. But what's important is this, is what Jews gathered in Jerusalem in our text today believed about Pentecost. They are bringing their love offerings and they are celebrating Mount Sinai. What happened in the book of Exodus at Mount Sinai? Exodus 19 says that there were loud sounds and God descended on Mount Sinai in a fire and his voice spoke. 1,500 years later in our text today, when the Jewish people are reflecting on Exodus 19 and 20, what happens? There's a loud sound of a violent wind and God comes down in a fire on the disciples and God's voice speaks again, this time through the tongues of the disciples. At Mount Sinai, God gave the law to his people as their guide for living. In Acts 2, the Spirit comes down to the hearts of many who are gathered. He is the new guide for living. At Mount Sinai, the people made a golden calf because they got tired of waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain. Their punishment was death of 3,000 people. How many people were saved at Pentecost in Acts 2? about 3,000 according to verse 41 of this chapter. Is that just a coincidence? God's timing is never coincidence. He is vowing, wowing the people gathered in Jerusalem. He is connecting them to the past and springing them into the future. There is also a connection to the Tower of Babel, which at this time we do not have time to get into, but there is their connection of speaking in many languages. There is also a connection to the temple and the Holy of Holies in the temple where God was present. In Acts 2, God's people become the new temple of the, of the Holy Spirit. God is wowing his people. He is connecting them to their past and springing them into the future. What does this mean for us today? At Pentecost, God invades. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon believers like never before. You live in the same era of the Holy Spirit's invasion. Do you recognize that the Holy Spirit has invaded your life? If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit has invaded you. What is this invasion? 
what has the Holy Spirit done? And what does he continue to do in your life and mine? Let's begin with the very fact of your existence. The psalmist in Psalm 139 says that God knit him together in his mother's womb. Who knit the psalmist together? Who knit you together in your mother's womb? The Holy Spirit. You grow in your mother's womb and come out of your mother's womb with physical life by the power of the Holy Spirit. But you were born into sin, and so you're spiritually dead. You were born physically alive and spiritually dead. So the Holy Spirit goes to work on your soul. He moves your heart and opens your mind to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior and Lord of the world, your Savior, your Lord. The Holy Spirit makes us spiritually alive. What next? He continues to dwell in you and work on you the rest of your life, here to make you more and more like Jesus. He battles against your sinful nature to make your heart and mind more and more like the heart and mind of Christ as you surrender and cooperate. He gives you his Christ-like fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He turns you more and more into a little Christ. The theological word for this is sanctification. What does the Holy Spirit do? First, he gives you physical life, and then he gives you spiritual life. And then he works in your life so that you can be more and more like Christ. I'm very thankful that he does that in me, knowing that he's continually guiding me, working in my life to make me more and more like Christ. Recently, at the lighthouse, we had a young man come into the lighthouse, never saw this man before. And he seemed to be fine, everything like that. And then one of my staff came upstairs and said, you need to come down. So I came downstairs. And then all of a sudden, when the man came out of the bathroom, he saw me, and then he started yelling things at me that aren't true or anything like that. And one of the things, my, and we finally asked him, got him out of the building and that, uh, we called the police for it. But one of the things my staff said was how could you be so calm with him yelling those things at you? I'm not going to say exactly what he said, but they were not very kind, very nice. They were very hurtful and painful. The guy never met me before, and yet those words were hurtful. But yet I felt the spirit power of the Lord working in me, the spirit working in me, making sure that I didn't say anything that would condemn this person or say anything that would hurt this person. I just continued to pray in my heart as well as to continue to guide him slowly out the door. But that was a challenge. But I knew that the fruit of the Spirit was in me at that time because I kept self-control. I was continually showing kindness. And my staff saw that in how I managed that situation. And it blew me away that they were able to see because I didn't say a whole lot to this person. And yet, they saw it. I said more to my staff, my male staff, than uh, volunteers than I did to him. Because this gentleman was irritated by males for some reason. But yet, we showed the love of God not expressing it, but show it to him. He came back a number of weeks ago, 
or a, lot, a, a week ago, back into the building, calm and peaceful. I never saw him. I was told he was back in the building. He acknowledged that he had done something wrong that day. But yet, it shows that we need to rely on the Holy Spirit to guide us when we deal with situations like that. And there's more. The Holy Spirit also works corporately. If you are married, he binds you to your Christian spouse who also has the Holy Spirit. That is why it doesn't make any sense for a believer to marry a non-believer. One spouse will have the Holy Spirit and the other will not. They are two totally different people. The Holy Spirit also binds you to other Christians. He binds you to your brothers and sisters here today. I like to say that I have more in common with young Christian adults sometimes that I work with than I have in common with a 50-year-old white ma male who shares my hobbies but does not have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit binds me to you and you to me and each of us to one another. We are one body because the Holy Spirit lives in each of us who had said yes to Jesus. He binds us together and then he gives each of us a gift to serve one another and the world. You and I have the Spirit and that is why we are bound together. We can come together worshiping God in all that he does for us. The Holy Spirit gives us physical life. He gives us spiritual life. And more and more moves us to be Christ-like. He binds us to each other and gifts us to serve each other and the world. What if we all really got this? What if we all took seriously the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives? What kind of people would we do? And what if we asked God to give us a fresh move of the Holy Spirit to re-energize us individually and corporately? And what if God decided to do just that here in the, our midst this morning? What if God decided to invade the house, this house, in a fresh way, like he invaded the house 2,000 some years ago at Pentecost? What if God made us more Pentecostal by placing sp the Spirit like he did on that Pentecost Sunday for his glory? In Luke 3, verse 16, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. May the Holy Spirit set our church on fire. May he give us faith and more faith. May he fill our hearts with love and joy and peace. May he turn us into brilliant Christ followers and show that others can see Christ through us. May he bind us to one another. May he energize us with fresh wind and fresh fire for the glory of God. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are reminded of Pentecost and what took place with the Spirit coming down on the disciples. But it's also a reminder for us too, Lord, that as believers, when we've accepted you as our Lord and Savior, the Spirit is in us as well. And that we through the power of the Spirit, can share the gospel with those around us. We can share it with confidence. We can share it with excitement, knowing that you are guiding us, giving us the wisdom and the courage to do it. Lord, as we 
are reminded on this Pentecost Sunday. Your spirit came down upon those disciples, but it also comes down upon us today because the spirit lives within us each and every day. Thank you, Lord. Amen. This time we're going to uh, prepare for Lord's Supper as you'll be celebrating Lord's Supper next Sunday. Uh, and that, um, we're going to read the preparatory exhortation that's found in the back of the Psalter hymnals, or is it on the screen? And that as well. Let me find the page then. It's faster to be on the screen than when I get it. To... Oh, I gotta do this again. As we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion, let us remember that Scripture calls us to examine ourselves before God. We are taught that eating and drinking unworthily brings judgment upon ourselves. Let us therefore ask God for the proper spirit in which to celebrate the sacrament. Almighty God, before whom can be neither secret thought nor hidden deed, grant us your spirit that we may know our hearts our lives and our inmost thoughts as you know them. Grant us your grace that we may repent sincerely of all sin, find peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ, and grow in assurance of salvation in him. May the celebration of our Savior's infinite love in his redeeming death bring joy to us and glory to you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the atoning power of our Savior's death and for our share in his victory over sin. Open our hearts as we prepare for this celebration that it may strengthen us in our faith, establish us in our hope, confirm us in our love. In his name, amen. Brothers and sisters, let us first examine our faith. We all confess the truth of God as taught by spirit or as taught by scripture and summarized in the creeds of the church. But this faith we take to ourselves, Christ, and all his benefits, so that for us to live is Christ. Lord God, author and finisher of all true believing, confirm our faith as we prepare for the holy sacrament. Let us further examine our hope. Our Christian hope rests upon the finished work of Christ as Savior. The Holy Gospel teaches that all our righteousness is in him alone. God's children rely wholly upon the merits of Christ, find in him their strength and victory, and confidently expect his return in glory. They look forward to celebrating his holy supper anew with him in the kingdom. They will surely be received by God at his table. Most merciful Father, fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may abound in hope. Let us examine our love, both for God and our neighbors. Remember the great and first commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let us consci consciously determine to live a life loving service to him through Christ our Lord. Let us also search ourselves to determine whether we love our neighbors as Christ commands. Do we self unselfishly live for the welfare of others? Do, do our lives reflect the godly virtues of obedience, fidelity, integrity, justice, humility, and contentment? Do we seek reconciliation with our neighbors in all cases of offense? Dear Father, daily increase in us the greatest gift of all, our Christian love. If these marks of spiritual life are not evident in us, we may not presume to approach his table. Those, therefore, who live in self-righteousness, who hope in works or virtues of their own, and who do not show love to God and neighbor, 
have no true place at the Lord's Supper. Yet we should not be deterred by any sin lingering within against our will. As we find faith, hope, and love within us, we ought gladly to obey our Lord's command and come with full expectation to God's open house of mercy. Gracious God, we love and adore you in Christ our Lord. We thank you for reconciling us to yourself and him. We rejoice in being received as your children. Prepare us by your Holy Spirit for the sacrament. Help us to come in the assurance that by it we shall be spiritually revived and strengthened in faith, hope, and love through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we respond in faith, you will have just an offering reminder that the offering this morning is for the candidacy committee and that it will be collected as you walk out the rear doors. And that let us uh, sing closing song, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Let us receive the Lord's blessing and depart in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.